Hey, uh, one of the things that we would do at camp, I won't make us do this here, but I just got back from a week of camp, uh, and we went uh, to Green Bay earlier this summer, and we're going to Sunny Bray uh, later on in the summer with some of our new high school students. And one of the things we would do is I'd always get it started by going, all right, everybody, I want you to look around you, get up, and give aggressive high fives to five people around you. So you can just turn over and say hi if you want. And Turn to the person next to you, and uh, there you go. Yeah, Kyle and Jack, you can you can uh, give an aggressive high five, and there you go. <laughs> awesome guys. Well, hey, listen, today we're talking a little bit about camp, and uh, I don't know. I, I'm just curious. First of all, who here has ever been to summer camp? Anybody? Okay, that's a lot of us. That's pretty cool. Uh, I also want to ask a follow-up question. Might not be as many of us, but who here made a significant faith decision at camp? Anybody? Yeah, incredible right? Whether that's for the first time or God's call in your life or, or for just reviving your heart. Guys, camp matters. And, and, and I want to talk a little bit about today about why God uses summer camp to transform lives. Something about getting out into the middle of nowhere and c- gathering around with other people our age and, uh, or a family camp and getting around the bonfire and doing crazy stuff and getting on a, you know, behind a boat on a tube, something about that, God takes that and uses it. And so I want to unpack that a little bit, and I also want to challenge us. As we're talking here today, I want to just challenge you. At the end, we're going to do some reflection in our own hearts and go, what is keeping me from living this way the rest of the year? But let me jump on in. I want to tell a few stories as well from, uh, like I said, I've been to camp a couple times this summer, and we're going on one more, and that's going to be awesome. So I want to recap some of those. You saw uh, that video was from our Green Bay leaders trip. So what we did was we went out to uh, Kelowna. I know, just the suffering for the sake of the gospel. But you know what? I'll, you just got to do it sometimes. And um, and so we went out, we took six students because um, camps are really struggling for, for leaders this year because we've kind of had a two-year gap in camp. And so some of those leaders, I noticed that there's a big gap in that kind of uh, 15, 16, uh, 17 age because those are the people who normally the last two years would have been junior high leaders and then, and then they come into full leadership. So we're seeing lots of young people who are, who are uh, involved in camp and lots of like 19, 20, 21-year-olds. But there's a little bit of a gap. Everybody's struggling with numbers. And so they said, hey, why don't you guys bring out some students who can't give a whole summer but can give one week. And so we came out. And you know what? If you've been on a mission trip, you know this, is that you go out thinking that you're going to impact the people that you're going to minister to, and you just leave so much more deeply impacted than anybody else. Now, we did some amazing stuff. We brought some new energy into camp and really helped those cabin leaders and made it so that, like, lifeguards didn't have to be in cabins and that kind of thing. And can I just say, we have some amazing young leaders in this church. Like, they absolutely rocked. We had five first-time cabin leaders, and we did, like, some sort of training on the way down. We watched a couple videos. We chatted about it, but they just got tossed into the fire, and they absolutely rocked it. So if you see one, um, you know, maybe uh, maybe you can definitely uh, give them a high five and say, hey, you rock. Um, but uh, yeah, so we went down there, and there's a couple stories, a couple highlights from there. I think the first one was this. So when you go to camp, you get to do lots of cool stuff and, uh, and find ways to hang out with students. So one of the cabin leaders, his name's Ryan, he comes to youth here, and, and uh, so Ryan and I jumped on a tube together, and then there was another tube behind the boat, so two tubes behind the boat, and, uh, and it was these two boys from Ryan's cabin. And so uh, normally what I heard the kids saying that week was, we want thrills, not spills. So that just means they want to go fun, have a fun tube ride, not do too crazy. They just want to have fun. So Ryan and I, we hop on thinking that's what it's going to be like. And uh, the boat driver turns to these two boys and they're like, uh, yeah, so what, what kind of level would you like? And they're like, we want you to try and murder us. And we're like, uh, uh-oh. uh So Ryan and I looking at each other. We're like, well, I guess we're on here now. So, and they did. They did. Yep. It was terrifying. But uh, we survived, so I'm here. Uh, rest in peace, Ryan. So, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm sure he's doing fantastic as well. But um, that was definitely one of the highlights. The road trip on the way down had to stop at Dutchman Dairy, you know, because uh, faith formation happens around ice cream. Uh, and if you haven't been there, you know, I had to jump in on a cabin. Somebody got sick, so I had to jump in on a cabin for two and a half days, and I realized I'm not old but I am not 16, uh, and that was, uh, took a lot of energy out of me. That was awesome. Uh, 
One of my uh, definite highlights, though, and I'm going to share a couple stories. Uh, I'm not going to share names because, uh, you know, just these are kids, and so just got to make sure that we uh, keep that private. But, uh, but there was this one boy that I met at camp. So uh, my role was just to kind of hang out, do whatever. Whatever they needed to me, me to do, whether it was a sweep a floor or, you know, hang out in the boat. Or, and so this time I was chilling outside the chapel. They were in chapel. There was this one guy. He was outside. And I'm like, I come up to him like, oh, hey, bro, how's it going? And he's like, hey, yeah, I'm doing fine. Just it's a little loud in there for me. And uh, I was like, oh, yeah, hey, totally cool. Well, we'll just hang out out here. So we got to talking. And I'm like, dude, what do you love to do? He's like, oh, I love to do art. And I'm like, oh, dude, tell me about that. I love art. And it's funny, he, he, his face kind of like, he was a little shy about it. He's like, well, you see, the style of art I like is kind of frowned upon. I was like, okay, like, what, what can that be? And he starts telling me about how uh, his brother is a spray paint artist, and he wants to be a spray paint artist. Now, his brother is one of, like a spray paint artist in maybe some illegal activity, but, uh, but he is talking about how he loves spray paint art, but he wants to be able to use it in a positive way. And I was like, oh, man, this is so incredible. So we started talking. I'm like, dude, can you draw me some? So I pulled out my, my notebook that I was working on, some notes for camp and stuff. And, and he, was, he started drawing me, showing me different styles and uh, different throws and tags, I think, is what it was. So I don't know a lot about spray paint, but, uh, but he was showing me. And, you know, camp is amazing because uh, we get to have these kind of conversations where uh, the gospel isn't just something we talk about in chapel. And, and I got to tell him about how, because uh, literally the right week before, I was painting in the garage out there, in our youth garage. I was painting the floor and then talking to a guy because we're going to get graffiti up on the wall. And he was, it, it just blew his mind. And we got to have this conversation about how God can take that art form and redeem it for good. In the same way God can take our lives and redeem them for good. And that was this incredible moment where he just came alive. He, he was this student who was kind of just off on the side. And then, like, literally a whole week, he just wanted to hang out and just wanted to draw and just, like, do whatever and talk. And he, he just came alive again. He's like, oh, man. Like, I was like, dude, you, if, you, if you need me to get you in contact, I'll get you in contact with a youth group. And you can, like, go and do some spray paint with them. And, and I know a, a, a girl from Toronto, and she teaches spray paint lessons and honors Jesus with that. And it was incredible. We got to have conversations like that. And uh, I think the last highlight from that Green Bay trip was, so we prayed together uh, as a group when we first got there, big huddle on the beach, and that was really awesome. But can I tell you, like, the prayer, we got together at the end of the week, and we gathered together on the beach in a group huddle, and something had changed in our students. Not the ones who we went to serve, but something in those who came to serve. And I, I was sitting there after, and we, we were just like, crying together because we had been so moved by the students that we had been able to share life with for a week. And guys, something about camp, it matters because God uses it to transform lives. Camp doesn't just impact the lives of the campers, but impacts our lives when we feel God's spirit speaking and moving and working through us. I always say this saying, um, you know, sometimes we want to know what God is doing. We want to experience God. We want to see him You're like, oh, I don't see God working. And I, I just want to, I challenge myself with, hey, if you want to see God working, get doing what God is doing. You know, and I think camp is a perfect example of that. That's why God transforms our lives so much because we're at work doing the things uh, that God is at work doing. I also got to speak at uh, SABC, Southern Alberta Bible Camp, just an hour uh, south of, hour and a half, I guess, maybe south of here. And I got to speak a little bit, and the first time ever I've ever speak, spoken at camp. And that was really, really cool for me. Uh, and, and uh, you know, because I've had speakers who have impacted my life and I just kind of got to give back and, and pour back in. And it was amazing. It was an amazing group. A couple highlights. So you get to do some cool stuff at camp. And one of the things we did was called Fire on Water. And I was like, I don't know what that is, but I'm in. So uh, well, apparently what we did, we went down to the dock. And we made like a raft of logs. And then we put it on the water, and then we built a fire, and then we roasted marshmallows, like, in the water. It was so cool. Except there was a problem, and n now I know for next time, is that, like, we used string to tie these logs together, but then you build a fire on top of it. And then I had to hold it together, but my thumbs were, like, burning off, so I've got no hair left on my hands. So I had to, like, hold it underneath the water, and, like, the fire's, like, right here. But whatever. It was fun. 
worth worth every little hair that I lost. Uh, we also got to do some, because uh, I was the speaker, so I, was, I said, hey, listen, if you guys have any questions, instead of a question box, we brought a question pig. So it, you could put questions in the pig. And I forget what they named him, but it was something weird. But uh, so you could put questions in. I said, hey, I'll run some activities, and you can ask any question. I don't care what it is. You can ask any question. And um, and so we were at the shooting range. They've got like a pellet pellet gun range there. And uh, and so we're doing Q&A, having some great conversations. And I'm like noticing, OK, when you get into southern Alberta and, and you get some farm kids out there, and I'm a farm kid, but like these little girls, they're just like pegging all these, these targets. I'm like, OK, don't get on your bad side because you got a dead eye there. It's like this like 13-year-old girl, and she's just like, pew, 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 and like hitting all the targets down. I'm like, that's terrifying. All right. We, you do that way too often, apparently. You know, guys, um, some of the other highlights and stories that happened uh, at, at camp, there was this one boy, and he had really kind of, we had connected really well that week. And he's, he had, uh, was from Alberta originally, but had lived out in Ontario, and they just moved back in the spring. And so he's pretty new. His parents uh, have a faith background, but they don't go to church. And, uh, and you know, he talked to me on Thursday night, and... And he came out to me and said, hey, Chris, like, you know, I've always believed in God, but now I kind of understand who he is. And, 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 and then he's like, hey, Chris, like, can I have a Bible? I'm like, dude, yes, of course. So I got to go. We walked over. I grabbed him one, uh, a new Bible. And I was like, hey, like, let me bookmark some of the pages we've been reading in this week so you can go back. So I bookmarked Genesis, like, chapters 1 to 3. And I bookmarked the Psalms for him. And I bookmarked, uh, I was like, dude, if you want to start reading, read in, in, in the book of John. Uh, and, and so l- the next morning, he comes up. He's like, hey, Chris, I, I haven't been able to sleep this week because the camp beds suck. But, uh, but he woke up at 7 o'clock. And he's like, yeah, I didn't have anything to do, so I just read through Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And I was like, wow, that's amazing, right? The story of God comes alive for this kid. There was this other girl, and, you know, you get to hear some hard stories at camp. Um, and she, I, she shared her adoption story with me and, and how um, her family had, had really, like, she had a really difficult time growing up. Uh, as a baby and, and, and all that. And she got to share about how she's in a healthy family now. But it was just one of those moments where you got to catch a glimpse of this 13-year-old who has gone through more than I ever will, probably. And yet, she gets to hear that there is a God who is not, on, not only loves her, but who is with her in the middle of her darkest times. And there was one more girl. Um, this is incredible. I mean, listen... <laughs> I do not like thinking about myself at 13. I was definitely awkward. But, um, but <laughs> this one girl, she came up to me, and I, I was speaking about how, hey, if, if God is putting something on your heart this week, you need to share it. You need to talk to somebody else. And she said, she came up, hey, Chris, can I grab you after chapel? Like, yeah, of course, sure. So we sat down, and she started sharing with me. She had been in a different camp before, and the, and the Spirit of God had really called out some gifts in her that week, like a really powerful experience with God. And, and this girl is incredible. I mean, she, she just started sharing with me and, and, and talking about, like, what God is doing in her life over the last year. And there's this, this 13-year-old girl who is just completely led by the Spirit, and God is pu- pulling out gifts in her, and it was absolutely incredible. And so on Thursday night, uh, which was our response night, uh, I, I went up to her head, and I was like, hey, listen, can you just pray? Can you just pray that the Spirit of God would move? And if anybody has anything that they need to just, like, respond to, can you just be there and just pray for them? All right? Just go up to them. And, just pray. and I'm like, wow, this is incredible. Like, nowhere else other than maybe, like, camp or, and I hope that happens here too, is, is like, a 27-year-old guy sharing, uh, sharing out of the Word while, like, you know, a 13-year-old girl is, like, the prayer warrior. And then, like, you know, and there's, there's teenagers who are, who are mentoring young students. And, and there's, like, uh, older people in, working in the kitchen. I, this morning <laughs> at the 9 o'clock, I said, uh, I said, there's old people in the kitchen. And then, and then, um, and then I, I remembered that our good friend Christy uh, Marsh is in the kitchen at Green Bay. And so uh, I didn't mean old. I just meant, you know, you know what I mean. Whatever. Okay. 
But something about, about camp really brings us together where we all contribute into what God is doing in, in the world. Those are some incredible stories. And I could tell you more and more and more. But I want to unpack a little bit today. Like why does camp have this impact on our life? Why? And why can't we see this happen in, in our lives too? So um, we focused on the second half of the week when I was speaking. We focused on the verse in John 14, 6, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And we unpacked a little bit about how the gospel is that Jesus has given us new life. See, the gospel speaks a power and a life into us that I think camp has a special role in. See, we talked about how what the gospel, we unpacked uh, each day, we just kind of unpacked, hey, what is it that God has done for us? And we talked about how in the gospel, God has defeated evil and sin and death on the cross. We did this illustration. It was a lot of fun. Um, So what we did, we, we started off the week by talking about how you are made in God's image. So every single human being, you are made in God's image. You are made like a mirror that is made to reflect God into the world, his goodness and his creativity and his beauty and and the gifts God has given you. But there's a problem. We look out at the world and we see that it's broken, but we also look in here and we find that there's brokenness in my life too. So what I did is uh, I had talked to these two young guys before and I was like, hey, listen, so when you come up, I'm going to have a mirror, and, uh, and I want you to take this hammer and just hit it softly so it cracks, right? Because that's the, kind of the image that, that sin, what it does in our lives is, is it breaks our identity that God has created us with. It, it, it reflects, instead of a clear picture of God's goodness, we reflect a distorted picture uh, back into the world, a broken picture back into the world, and that's, that's sin. And so he comes up, and he did pretty good, and, uh, and so he comes up and he, he hits it, and it's safety glass, so I'm like, don't worry, it's going to be fine, but just so that we don't make a mess, right? He hits it, but he doesn't hit it hard enough, and it doesn't crack, and he's like, oh. So he takes up, he winds up, and just bang, and just shatters glass absolutely everywhere. I mean, it was impactful. It was hopefully memorable, but it's very, I'm like, Whew, okay, that was everybody good, but uh, it was hilarious, but it was a good image of what you know, what sin does in our lives, not only out there, but in in our own heart, is it shatters us. And we talked about how, how on the cross, Jesus begins to undo that. That not only the, because, because listen, the number one question I get from students is why do bad things happen if God is good? I think that is the number one question that we need to ask as human beings. Why do bad things happen if God is good? And and we talked a little bit about how God's response and his victory over sin and death and evil, not just out there, but in here too, is the cross. That actually, Jesus is the one who has defeated death on the cross. And we talked about this uh, handcuffs illustration, which is fun. Maybe we could put someone in handcuffs today. These are fake, which is no fun. We need to get some real ones. That would be a lot of fun. I heard Brad got put in handcuffs the week I was away. I'm like, I'm so sad. We need to get a video of that. Come on. I missed all the fun stuff. Anyways, um, and we, t- we, we came up and we put somebody in handcuffs. And we, and, and we talked about how, how sin is also this thing that keeps us tied to it. That we can't move in the direction that God is calling us to because it has power over us. And yet, Jesus is the one who takes our place. Because Jesus tells this parable. He says, uh, you can't go into a strong man's house and rob him unless you first go in and bind him up. And Jesus is the one who goes in and he, and he defeats sin so that he can step into our place. He is the one who is more powerful than sin and death and all the evil in the world. See, God's response to suffering is to suffer with us and to defeat death by dying on the cross. See, we talked about how Jesus is the way. And I want to share this with you here this morning. We talked about how, how before We even move towards him. God moves towards us. 
But the reality of the gospel is that before I even started to move towards God, he is the one who draw, drew near to me first. Isn't that incredible? I just want you to think about that for a second. Jesus is the way. He is the one who made the way back to God. So many of us try so many different ways. We try and take that mirror that is shattered and we try and glue all the pieces back together, see if we can get it just right so that maybe, just maybe, God will like me. Or maybe I can get my life together on my own. And yet the reality is that we need God to move towards us. And that is exactly what he has done. We talked about Jesus as the way and Jesus as the truth, the true king who has come to rescue us, the one who, who does for us what we can't do on our own. I, had, I told this story um, when I was back in school. Uh, I, was, I grew up on a farm, okay? So grew up on a farm, and so I took the bus to school. And so my dad, as I was leaving for school, he told me, hey, I'll see you after school, which I took as, hey, my dad's going to pick me up. He'd do that sometimes. Great. I don't have to take the hour and a half bus ride home. And so uh, I was like, great. So I go at the end. My, my bus driver's my next door neighbor. And he's like, hey, uh, I, or I told him, hey, uh, I'm not going to be on the bus. My dad's going to come pick me up. He's like, okay, great. Sounds good. So I waited on the playground. Now, the playground at Glen Avon School is, uh, it's like a big fort, right? So you can kind of hide in it, whatever. And so we, what we did, what I did was I was just chilling on the fort. I was like, ah, my dad will show up and I'll pop out when, when he comes. Half an hour goes by. My dad's not here. I'm like, okay, that's weird, but that's fine, whatever. Uh, maybe he's still coming. And then an hour goes by. I'm getting a little nervous. I'm going like, okay, maybe he forgot, but I know he'll be here soon. I started to get a little nervous. Another hour goes by. See, I was a really, really shy kid growing up. Like, really shy. And, and what I could have done was literally walk. My, my aunt and uncle were the janitors of the school. I could have walked in and be like, hey, can you call my dad? And, or, or literally my grandpa. Li this is a town of 200 people, just so you know, right? I could have walked to my grandpa's house or my best friend's house, but my response was very different. I started to feel a ton of shame. Uh, I, I don't know why, but I just felt like it was my fault. I had misunderstood, and my dad's going to be angry at me. I'm alone here. I need to hide. I cannot think about that moment without thinking about Genesis chapter 3. There's this moment where Adam and Eve, uh, uh, like the humans, they, they make this choice. Not just to eat a fruit, but to turn their back on God. To, to rebel against God and say, God, God, your way is not good enough. I want to be God. And, and they turn away from him, but the moment happens in this like haunting line, it says, they, were, they knew they were naked and they were ashamed. And so what do they do? They hide themselves from the presence of God. A brokenness enters into our world. And, and shame replaces that free and beautiful relationship with God. Maybe so, that's some of our experience here today. What happened was, um, see, I went and hid. And what, if, if I wouldn't have hid, I would have realized that they had sent my friend Stephen to, like, bike around town and try and find me. Again, it doesn't take that long to get around Glen Avon. Uh, but, uh, but I hid, and they were driving around. And, but finally, my dad, about two and a half hours, I see my dad's truck show up. And I just run out to him, and I'm crying. And, and uh, you know, I thought he was going to be so angry with me, but he just gives me a great big hug. And I think we went and got ice cream, because I think ice cream fixes everything. So, uh, Did I mention I was 17? No, I'm just kidding. I was... <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. I think I was in like grade three or something like that. But, but what a beautiful demonstration of what God does for us. See, we, we talked about this at camp, uh, that in John chapter 1, uh, in John chapter 1 it says, uh, in verse 14 it says, the word became flesh and made his tent among us. He tabernacled among us. And actually, I love the way that Eugene Peterson puts it. He says, uh, the word became flesh and God moved into the neighborhood. Man, what a beautiful picture. I don't know if you feel far from God right now, but listen, it's not about you running back because he has moved into your neighborhood. He has drawn near before you have done anything to put the pieces of your own life back together. See, Jesus uh, is the tr true rescuer that sent 
to save us. He is the one true way, the one truth. Uh, for me, I met God at a camp. It's so powerful. I grew up going to church, uh, but it never really clicked. You know, it clicked up here, but not here. And I remember I was, uh, I just turned 16 years old, and you know what kind of comes along with uh, being in your teens, you know, and it's kind of started to go in the party scene and that kind of thing, and just kind of explore who I was. And it didn't sit well with me, but hey, listen, if you want to have any friends at all, you got, you're just kind of going along with this, right? And I remember that I just turned 16 in June, and then, uh, you know, we were at a party, whatever, and I remember the next day waking up and going, literally next week, I'm going to camp, because I had volunteered to be a junior leader, to tell people, tell little kids about how awesome Jesus is. And there was this moment I had, I was walking, uh, uh, so like that started to sit in my mind, and then I had gone to camp, it was staff training, and I, and I was walking uh, past these teeter-totters, and I just had this moment where I just stopped dead in my tracks. And the Spirit of God just opened up my eyes, and he's, I, I saw my life was headed this way, but God wanted my life to head this way, and it came to this moment where it crashed. But you guys know what? It wasn't one of those moments where I felt like, you know, conviction where you feel like, man, I'm just such a piece of garbage. You're not good enough. Come on, get your life. It wasn't that. It was the kindness of God that led me to repentance. It was the embrace of God, the reality that I had not drawn near. But that didn't matter. God's response to my sin was to seek me out even when I was hiding. That is beautiful, and maybe some of us need to hear that this morning. Jesus rescues us by letting all the weight of our rebellion and sin and brokenness fall on his shoulders. He carries our cross, and Jesus suffers to save us. But the last point about the gospel, and this is what I think the gospel is all about, is that Jesus comes to give us true life now and forever. Uh, there used to be this cat at camp, uh, and one, one uh, like it was a kitten, right? And so then the next year it grew up and it was this tomcat meant to catch all the mice. And I don't know what happened, but it got an infection in its eye. And it was, like, it was terrifying. So if something happened, it was like way big and puffy, pus all over. But what happened to the eye is it turned blood red. Not just like a little, not a little bit of bloodshot, the whole thing. Everything except for the black parts was blood red. And so we always made this joke that if you looked into the cat's eye, then you would like die or something like that. I don't know, whatever. We were teen teenagers. We were just making stuff up. But, uh, but it was terrifying. So like we just <laughs> were like, okay, stay away from this cat, whatever. Uh, I remember one week it went away. We're like, well, something got it in the woods, right? You know, or that eye infection finally got it because a week passed, another week passed. And the third week, all of a sudden we see the cat show up. And it's perfectly healed. I'm not joking you. Except for, like, you could tell that the one eye was a little bit darker, but it was, like, perfectly healed. And, uh, and as we talked about the resurrection this week, I was like, that story came to mind because this cat definitely went from death to life. Uh, not, you know, not to save anybody else, but because uh, it th probably got, I think it, I think it's now, let's, let's leave it, let's believe this, that it is now living out the rest of its days as a happy farm cat. We're just going to believe that. I don't know if it's true or not. Uh, we're just going to leave it at that, okay? So, uh, but, <laughs> but the reality is, if we reflected on the resurrection, is that, see, the good news of the gospel is not just that Jesus died for you, because if he stays dead, it's not good news, but that his resurrection reconnects us to God's eternal life. And that's not just a life that we get to experience one day in the future, but a life we get to be invited into right now. That the death of Jesus is not the end of the story. See, there's something about camp when we, when we reflect on that truth, these truths of the gospel. See, camp is amazing. You know, you get to go tubing and, and mountain biking or play awesome games and hang out with friends your age and, and have uh, amazing cabin leaders, but there's something that takes it over the edge. And in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, it says, I am unashamed of the gospel, the good news about Jesus, for it is the power of God to save all who believe. There's something about camp and the story that we orient our lives around that releases God's power into our lives to save all who believe. Camp is great, but it is the power of God that actually transforms our lives. Uh, and I want to just, 
unpack really quick a couple uh, reasons why I think that's true. See, the first thing that I think about at camp is, at camp we are saturated with the good news. You think of like, like a sponge that can't soak up any more water and being in the word and being in prayer and worship together, it shifts our focus back to the creator because so often we can get so distracted. You know, we have a schedule and a community that pushes us to stay integrated, right? It's like at home, I don't know about you, I'm not super disciplined all the time. I'm trying to go to the gym every day I'm in Calgary. And some days I don't want to, but Hannah's going to, and so the days I don't want to, she does, and the days she doesn't want to, I do, and so we keep each other accountable, and at camp, what happens is, uh, right, you got a schedule, you got meals, you got chapels, you got activities, you just keep on going, right, and, and it gets us back focused and saturated in this good news, this truth about who Jesus is and what he's done for us. What I also think is that God's presence isn't just something we experience in a church service, it becomes part of our whole life. You know, in, in the moments on the boat or, or the moments as a cabin down by the water or, you know, talking together around a campfire. These become gospel moments at camp and we're saturated. Prayer becomes our way of life. I think the second thing that camp really does in a practical sense is that at camp we experience relationships the Jesus-shaped way. Right? All these people have come from all around, uh, you know, so I was in southern Alberta, so uh, SABC. So all these people have come from around southern Alberta, and they've come together for one purpose, is to allow God to shape our lives after his way. And, and so then what that does is it starts to change the way we relate to each other, right? In the kingdom of God, I think, like, that is such an amazing thing because we orient our lives around Jesus and it changes the way that we relate to each other, the way we lead and the way we serve and all these different things. And we start to experience Jesus-shaped, redeemed relationships. It's beautiful. I got a picture up here, um, and this is some of our team. We went to Green Bay. So we got Jimmy up there. Uh, Jimmy and I, we did this thing where uh, you each go on the end of a canoe, and you stand on, like, the gunnels, and then you have to try and get the other person off by going up and down. So much fun, right? I won. I won. Just Jimmy's really good at balancing, though. He's really good. This is our team down here. Bef as you can tell, before we left, we didn't quite look so good afterwards. Uh, Declan playing some awesome. Like, can I just brag on these guys for a second? Like, how amazing it is that they would give up a week of their summer, and they just gave it all in and served and led these young kids like they've been doing all their life. They are amazing people, and you need to definitely, definitely just pray for them and, and, and just encourage them. But a kingdom-shaped community gives us a glimpse of what happens when God puts the pieces of people's hearts back together and, and organizes us into one community. And I just want to ask, like, what if God's doing that here, right? See, at camp, we serve because God first served us. And at camp, we mentor. You, you all have a mentor. And if, can I challenge you? If you don't have somebody who's mentoring you or, or a way that you are mentoring somebody else, whether that's through an official ministry like kids or youth or young adults or, or whatever, but, but if you're just finding some, hey, just take them for coffee, then can I encourage you that with that? Because I think that's one of the main reasons camp transforms lives is because we share with one another around this Jesus kingdom-shaped community. We allow God to change our hearts and our lives. The, uh, and the last kind of point here that I think, as I've been reflecting on my years of camp, that I think, I think this is one that we miss maybe around here. But I think camp does such a good, good job. At camp, we get to taste the fullness of life. This photo up here. I love this. I guess her name is on it, but it's okay because you don't know her. Uh, this is Peyton. So Peyton and I, we really connected because I hung out at the boats all week. So Peyton's, I think she's going into like grade three or something, right? And so we connected really well, and Peyton wanted to learn to water ski. And so, uh, and so I was like, Peyton, we're going to rock this. She's never water skied before. She's like seven, right? This is amazing. So, so they've got a boom there, and so she tries getting up on the boom, and she's doing pretty good, and, and she's rocking it. And I said, hey, listen, Peyton, uh, I think our, our goal should be by the end of the week, you're going to get up on the long rope on the back, right? So like, you know, the big, long, like, water ski rope. And she's like, oh, man, I don't know, but okay, let's go for it. So we were there, and we made little steps every single day. She got up on, like, the little uh, training rope and the boom. And, uh, and on Thursday, I wasn't on the boat. And then and I heard she, she wasn't able to, she didn't try. She didn't have the courage to try in the long rope. So I was like, Peyton, listen, I'm going to be there on Friday. 
and you're going to get up on the long rope. And she's like, yes, we're going to do it. And she was so excited, and she got up on the long, she went back on the long rope, and so we put her in the water, and she's a little nervous, but we give her the rope, and we, we are like, all right, Peyton, are you ready? And she's like, yeah, I'm ready. And she pops right out of the water, and it's amazing, and I'm taking a picture, and she like totally face plants. She got to keep that one, so that's why I don't have a picture of it. It was hilarious. But she pops right back up. She's like, I, po- I made it up. I stood up for like two seconds. And then, and then she's like, well, I'm going to go again. And she goes again, and she just rocks it, right? And just keeps water skiing. You know what, guys? Sometimes we think that the gospel is something we experience in this room here, and yet it's not. When God transforms our lives, every moment becomes a gospel moment. That we get to experience the fullness of life because of Jesus, and that right there gave me a picture of joy. It says in Psalm 16, 11, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. I just want you to sit with that for a second and think, have I experienced fullness of joy? If I haven't, why not? Has the gospel become something that I've just left here at church? Or is is it giving me joy everywhere I go? Is every moment a gospel moment? Man, what a beautiful picture of, of what the gospel does in our lives not only the fun things we do, not only the message of Jesus, but when they collide, they transform our lives. It's incredible. Guys, I'm going to invite the worship team up just as I land the plane here. Because maybe God is moving and shifting in you, because I want to tell stories about camp, but I don't want it to stay at camp, okay? Like maybe, maybe something's stirring you like, man, why haven't I experienced that? Or, or I have, but it's kind of grown dim, or, or I'm there and I'm not sure what to do with it. I think there's a few things about camp that, that really support us, that sometimes the reality is when we get home, the fire can die out. And I wonder if maybe for some of us, there's a few reasons. One, maybe we haven't understood or dug deep enough into what the gospel is, and so it's become normal to us. That maybe for you, you're, you've got this picture of who God is, and it's not all that attractive, and you don't, you know, maybe, I don't know, it just doesn't draw you, and so you're, you're just going through the motions right now. And hey, listen, we've all been in that moment where we're just kind of going through the motions. But what if, as you reflect on the beauty and depths of the gospel, God starts to renew in your life? I challenge you to do that the rest of the summer. Maybe for some of us, We're having a hard time being saturated. Anybody else around here? Like we're having a hard time staying in the Word, staying in worship because there's so many things that pull us each and every way and so we forgot what it's like to be in the presence of Jesus. What's keeping you from being saturated? Do you have a Jesus-shaped community around you? Right? Like, have you engaged in friendships that, that those friends who can call you out on your garbage or those friends who can see, like, okay, Chris isn't doing good today. Hey, just remember, Chris, Jesus not only died for you, but he raised you to new life. Do you have, are you serving? Are you being a mentor? And do you have a mentor to somebody else? Because, guys, I always say this, the, the way we experience God is through each other. You are the experience of the Holy Spirit to somebody else. God speaks through you. So are you engaged in a Jesus-shaped community that is putting the pieces of your heart back together as you reflect God's goodness into the world? And maybe the toughest one. Have you experienced that in Jesus there is fullness of joy? Right? Are you aware of the presence and joy of God every moment? Or is it reserved for Sundays? Psalm 19 once says, The heavens declare the handiwork of God. Thursday night, we had a worship night and, uh, out at camp, and we just sat and watched the stars. Because God speaks in incredible ways in every single ordinary moment, as He does in this room here. And so as we think, why does camp have such an impact on our lives? Maybe you've had that experience. Maybe the fire's died out a little bit. I want to ask you, what is keeping you from living the rest of the year like that? Let's pray. 
Jesus, we're so grateful for the stories we can share about your transformation. God, you are not done working through camp, through this community, in each one of our individual lives and through us as well. God, you are not done working, and yet, Lord, sometimes the fire grows dim. God, would we meet you again? Would you call us to where we need to go? And would we have the courage to be there? God, thank you for camp. We pray for those who are serving this week, that you would give them energy, uh, that you would make clear your gospel through every single moment. Chapel, on water skis, sitting on the beach, and through the friendships and the people and relationships that we make both at camp and at home. God, you are so